Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, okay, so short, so that clearly means you are keen to have something to eat and drink rather than listen to me, so we'll see how we go. Um, I thought I might talk a little bit about some recent findings we got from a study relating to cannabis use trajectories, development course and consequences. This is a very um, topical issue, shall we say, given the current um, of the announcement today and our pending referendum in about 16 months' time or thereabouts. Um, and um, the, I guess the, it reflects changing attitudes both nationally and internationally of freeing up of, of views around cannabis and, and um, the legislative framework thereof. Uh, and I thought, just, just to begin, this is a, that's not going to do it, I'll have to go over here and do it by hand. That won't pull over, will it? Alright. Um, down button. Down button. Here we go. Here's something I found on Wikipedia the other day, just basically a description of the current legal status of recreational cannabis use internationally. I, I hadn't sort of don't really have a feel for exactly what it looks like, but these guys are very helpfully keeping us up to date. So, if we went back to say the 1960s, 1970s, the UN Convention on Drugs, the US led war on drugs, then the whole world basically would have been pink or red, illegal. So, and just, just to emphasize, I'm talking about recreational use here, not medicinal use. Um, but of course, in the last decade in particular, we've seen internationally a lot of a uh, substantial trend away from um, full criminalisation to a range of options. A um, substantial part of the world now decriminalised, um, so we have quite a few countries in Europe there, um, parts of Australia and a lot of the Americas where it's now decriminalised. And of course, um, particularly in the last two or three years, we've seen substantial moves in North America uh, towards full legalisation. but. I wasn't aware that Uruguay, South Africa and Georgia also apparently are legalised. Um, now when you look at the legalisation framework, um, obviously there's a lot of variability in what's happened legislatively. So in California it's basically open slather, anything goes, billboards the works, um, whereas you take can, um, Canada, for example, or Vermont, they've taken a much more of a harm reduction focus, a much much greater care around the, um, the, the framework by which sale, distribution, supply and so on, a lot more care around provision of treatment services and those sorts of things. So there's a range of options that's available to us uh, and it looks like at the moment the government uh, probably wisely has decided we haven't got um, time before the next election to actually fully investigate all of those options that are available to us. So we're going to put out some basic headers and then we'll think about the detail later on, depending on whether or not the country wants to follow us down that track. Now, um, it's important, I think, and I think you'd all agree, that if we're going to change the legislative environment in which cannabis is used or consumed, then we need to monitor the nature of, or the impact of those changes on consumption, on harm and so on, so that we need to accompany uh, any change by, by continual monitoring and evaluation. If we go back 30 years, um, there was very little that was really known about cannabis related harm. And coming out of our study and a number of other studies around the world, there's been a lot more, we know a lot more now about the nature of harm, particularly around the harms for those who um, show early onset in, in adolescence, of course. So things like educational failure, um, gateway effects into other illicit drug use, risks of developing cannabis dependence, um, mental health effects, particularly around psychosis, those sorts of things that we're now a lot more familiar with uh, than we were 20 or 30 years ago. But there's still a lot we don't know around um, the context and harms and consequences of cannabis use and it's useful I think to keep uh, looking at the, these issues. One of the areas that in the context of a longitudinal study that is useful uh, is the ability to monitor um, trajectories of behaviour across the life course. And in respect to cannabis, what we've collected over time is every year from about age 15 
up to age 35 and actually goes beyond that, but I'm only talking about up to age 35. We've asked people, how often have you, have you used cannabis in the past 12 months? So we have a year by year description of cannabis use over the life course. And you can see here that, um, as you'd expect, most people don't use, but as you go up the scale here towards the, these at the top, a substantial minority of the cohort use cannabis on a regular basis, be it weekly or daily, uh, and seemingly for quite a prolonged period of time. Um, now, it's clear that in the context of most developmental processes around substance use, you see this clear onset rapid onset in adolescence, typically peaking in the early to mid-twenties before it declines away. Most people give up substance abuse or, or, or related behaviours. Um, and that's what's reflected in that sort of U-shape there. But concerns are really around those individuals up there, the sort of 10, 15, 20 percent of the cohort who have appear to have used for a prolonged period of time on a very regular basis. So interest then is really in can we take the cohort of around about a thousand people, characterise different patterns of use over time uh, and look at the consequences, the, the, the process associated with those, those factors and, and the outcomes thereof. So let's wave, wave a magic wand, statistical wand and characterise trajectories of cannabis use. So we've classified the cohort here into six groups reflecting different trajectories. So at the bottom the red there, they're clearly the non-users. They may have experimented once or twice, but essentially uh, non-users. That's around about two-thirds of the cohort. Uh, more women than men. This grey group here are the sort of occasional users. They, they play around a little bit, maybe up to as often as monthly, but essentially they, they grow out of it. There's another group here in blue, um, shown early onset peaking a bit more than monthly, but around about age 20 they also grow out of it. So by the time they're in their mid-twenties they're essentially behaving like the non-users. Those two groups are both around about 10 or 11 percent of the cohort. Over here we've got two other groups show rapid onset in adolescence. So by their late teens they're using at least weekly if not daily, and in fact our data here is a little bit inaccurate around daily use, so you can probably imagine these have gone higher. Um, and half of them grow out a little bit later in adulthood, the other half continue, persist right through into their 30s as regular daily users. Both of those groups are around about, well that's groups about 5% of people, that's about 7%. And then we have another group here in the yellow, which I find quite interesting. It's a group who actually don't start out using regularly, but transition into regular cannabis use as they get older. So by their 30s, they're using cannabis use just about as often as the chronic users. Again, around about 5% of the cohort. So in terms of public health implications, we're probably most interested in these three high use trajectories. You know, what are the factors that determine that the, how those, those young people turn out to, to follow those trajectories, what are the consequences of those patterns of use for, say, adult functional outcomes if we look in the mid-30s. Now, of course, longitudinal study, we know an awful lot about these children or these young people before they started using cannabis. So we can look at the pattern of associations with um, childhood, family uh, and other factors. And what you see is exactly what you'd expect to see, I guess, that those high use groups, the, the adult onset and those two early onset uh, long term use patterns, are characterised by greater uh, disadvantageous features of their childhood and family environments and their individual characteristics. So greater, greater socioeconomic disadvantage, greater family dysfunction of, of the many forms that we're aware of, um, parental illicit drug use monitor, um, modelling of behaviour and so on. Individual characteristics relating to um, higher risks of things like childhood conduct disorders, um, higher, higher rates of novelty seeking, so personality factors that occur in childhood, and uh, much higher rates for male and Māori. Those three trajectories, high risk trajectories, around about 80% of those of, of the individuals in those groups are male. Now if we look at the whole 
out of many factors, and there's probably about 30 things I've summarised there, but if we look at the key things that, that appear to predict, they are being male, um, having individual characteristics that reflect um, basically being a chancer in life, so you're, you're more likely to be conduct disordered, you're more likely to be a novelty seeker. Um, having individuals around you who model um, illicit drug use, so having parents or family members or peers who use illicit drugs, and then um, general family disadvantage, so family breakdown, child abuse, those sorts of factors. That's the sort of mix of things. So a mix of sort of biologically or genetically relevant factors, uh, modelling influences and social and family influences. So that's, that's the mix, and it's pretty much what you'd expect to see. What about the other end of the game? If we take the outcomes in our mid-30s, what are the functional outcomes for these trajectories? Oh, blimey. So we've taken our childhood factors, we've seen how they might influence trajectories, and now we're going to look at the outcomes. Now the data I'm going to show you here with relations to outcome is controlling for all those childhood influences that are differences between their trajectories. So what you're seeing here is net of, net of all those childhood factors. So if we look at substance use disorders in adulthood, what do we see? Well, if we look at this, these two groups in particular, that adult onset group and that long-term chronic group, you can see they've got consistently higher rates of substance use disorders um, compared to the other groups and certainly compared to these low-risk trajectories here. So, if nothing else, these two groups in particular show a pattern of um, what polysubstance abuse, I guess you'd describe it as, which perhaps in their mid-30s maybe hasn't much com negative com consequence for their life, but in terms of long-term physical health, clearly that's going to have uh, an impact before too long. If we look at um, mental health, Sorry, I'm pressing too hard, clearly. And I'm only putting up some comparisons here just to show you, but mental health, a similar sort of pattern. These, these higher risk trajectories typically have higher rates of depression, anxiety, um, psychotic-like symptoms and so on. They, they show the same pattern, they're higher risk than the other trajectories. So this is an area which I, I find perhaps most interesting, socioeconomic outcomes. If you look at educational attainment, so these high risk trajectories here um, have much lower rates of tertiary qualification than the low risk trajectories. Not surprising because we know that early onset use is associated with educational under attainment. If we, took, if we looked at degree attainment, those differences would be substantially worse. If you look at income, these trajectory groups on average all other things being equal, have incomes that are about two to three hundred dollars a week less than other other individuals, and that's reflected in also in, in uh, value of savings and investments, uh, and of course things like home ownership, higher rates of welfare dependence. So these guys are experiencing substantially uh, more adverse socio-economic um, life course outcomes. And if we look at the last one, social outcomes. Not surprisingly, perhaps, the higher risk trajectories are also less likely to have established stable partner relationships to have dependent children, or maybe you think that it's an advantage in this case. Um, higher rates of intimate partner violence, higher risks of things like arrest conviction. Now some of the differences I've shown you are not all that dramatic, but when you look at the pattern right across all of those domains of adult functional outcomes, what it clearly suggests is that the life course outcomes for those in high risk groups are very different from those in low risk groups. So basically the choice to adopt a lifestyle characterised by frequent heavy or chronic cannabis use has consequences and you may not acknowledge those, that, those when you start out but it certainly um, occurs to you later on and certainly a number of those in the high risk trajectory groups um, have commented along the lines of things like it would be nice if I could earn more money now as an adult than I currently am, things like that. So you start seeing 
people becoming aware over time of the consequences of their actions. Uh, and as I said, those differences are net of all the childhood influences that we can measure. So whatever it is about these trajectory groups, we haven't explained what those differences are. And those differences are very substantial. Why has it done that? So that leads us to ask What are the other explanatory factors? I'm getting near the end. Um, now some of the things that people talk about. So accumulated social capital. Okay, we know if you're an early, if you start using as an adolescent, and any, any decent high school teacher will tell you this, kids who use cannabis in high school tend to drop out. So we know that there is, there is a loss of social capital in terms of accumulative educational attainment, and you would expect that to be reflected over time as individuals in lower cannabis use trajectories actually are more likely to attain further qualifications and so on. Um, so it's not surprising, you would expect there to be some um, loss of social capital. But when we take a measure of social capital into account, that still doesn't explain all of those socioeconomic differences that we see. So the income differences still exist and so on. Um, a motivation is something which is commonly referred to by psychologists in the context of heavy cannabis use. Heavy users become lack motivation and therefore they don't, um, as a consequence, they don't succeed in life. Uh, our data suggests that's only partially true because even when we take into account a measure of adult motivation, we still don't explain those differences. They persist no matter what we throw at them. So that leads us to a consideration of some of the other things that at this point in time are relatively under-researched with respect to cannabis use. So things like uh, the genetics of substance dependence, um, epigenetic factors or changes in epi epigenetic changes due to chronic cannabis use for example, changes in brain structure function, uh, neurocognitive um, processes and so on. And it's this area that we're now moving towards developing in terms of use of things like imaging uh, and so on. And it's that money from, from the um, wine and art auction which is going to enable us to begin piloting processes around this uh, to develop more sensitive measures uh, in this area. Uh, and some of you in this room tonight, like Tracy and so on, are, are affiliated with us in terms of moving this, this forward. Now, <coughs> I just want to illustrate one, with one last slide um, something around the genetics, or the epigenetics in fact. This is work that's um, being done by um, Amy Osborne at the University of Canterbury uh, in association with Martin Kennedy here at the medical school and a few others using our data to look at the epigenetic effects of regular cannabis use. Now we're quite excited about this because this is a very under-researched area internationally uh, and what Amy has been able to show is that um, it's not entirely clear but those little red marks all, all across the genome there reflect differentially methylated sites in the genome related to heavy or regular cannabis use. Uh, and we're in the process of hopefully replicating this in, in some other cohorts at the present time which may be, will be the first truly replicable finding around the epigenetic effects of cannabis uh, internationally. Um, these effects are, importantly, they're different from those associated with tobacco use. Um, and this is, a, a tobacco of course is, is strongly confounded with cannabis use as you saw in that, in that slide about outcome. Heavy users tend to smoke a lot so we have to try and tease those e effects apart. Um, but the other aspect about it, this is that an awful lot of those hits uh, to do with genes that are to do with brain structure, function and neurocognitive process. So ideally in another 10 years time when I'm retired and my, my uh, colleagues who take over from me uh, have explored this in, a, in much greater detail, we bring into, the, into that the imaging results, uh, neurocognitive testing and so on, we'll have a much better picture of what are the long term consequences of cannabis use. <coughs> 
uh, for the cohort. And that's all I wanted to say. Look on behalf of everyone, John. Oh, John. Uh, John, that was fascinating, and it actually is, is great to see our money put to such good use and such a topical issue. So I'm sure um, Labor will be coming to see you before they, um, they go to the public next year because the research is fascinating. Well, actually, it's the Ministry of Justice who's doing all the consultation, and they have. Great. <laughs> Pleased to hear it. So, look... Um, thank you for acknowledging John's presentation. It's always great to hear from him. Um, and this will be our intent for subsequent uh, AGMs as the wine and art recipients from each year will get an opportunity to present to subsequent AGMs. I want to thank everyone who's come along tonight. We're going to now adjourn through to the next uh, room for drinks and nibbles, so please join us. It's a chance to actually connect with some great people in the room. I also want to thank all our presenters tonight, they did a sterling job, so this is my first AGM and uh, it was flawless, so thank you everyone. Uh, and just a big thank you to everyone.